Please allow me uh, to encourage each of us to continue to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ, the royal law of neighbor love. These days are marked and marred by sickness, stress, strain, but let's long to be both helpful and hospitable and in so doing walk in his steps. For the Lord did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us love one another well in these days. Dr. Gregory, please come. Thank you, Dean Still, and to our Druid Black Students Association uh, for this day and joining together just to that end during Black History Month. It's my privilege to introduce uh, to some of you, to present to most of you, Reverend Dr. Ralph D. West, Sr. He is the founder and the senior pastor of Houston's Church Without Walls. Dr. West is married to the delightful first lady of that church, Sister Sherita West, had three adult children, all three of whom are graduates of Truett Seminary. Dr. West was the founder of this church, also known as Brook Hollow, it was founded in a residence more than 30 years ago with a few more than 30 people. The church now meets on Sunday on three campuses in Houston and in ordinary times, other than these days of distress, Dr. West will face personally more than 8,000 people in three locations on Sunday. And beyond that, not only locally, but internationally on Daystar, a global television uh, congregation. Uh, he's a graduate of the storied Bishop College, a college in Dallas that was remarkable for the number of incredible preachers that were graduated from that school, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, the MDiv, and Beeson Divinity School with a Doctor of Ministry. Many of you know that at schools, colleges, conferences, denominational meetings, revivals, Bible studies all over this country, there are few people, if any, that are more invited than Dr. Ralph D. West, Sr. Uh, he's also the founder of one of the nation's largest conferences for ministers and pastors, IC3. And I'd like to note in that, that not only meets in Houston, uh, it's been a great grace that Dr. West has moved the entire conference and conducted it in South Africa as well, so that persons there might be able to participate in IC3. To my knowledge, it's the only such mobile conference like that. He's author, he's speaker, he's a friend of Truett Seminary. Going back further than you might think, he was actually at the meeting uh, when John Ball, Herbert Reynolds and others met in Houston uh, to raise the money for the beginning of Truett Seminary before it even met down at First Baptist in Waco. So his connection with this school goes back uh, before the school was actually founded. Uh, the first class of our Houston Extension was conducted in the Church Without Walls several years ago. What many would not know is the degree to which Dr. West is a mentor and pastor of pastors. He and I hang out a good deal together and his phone rings ceaselessly with pastors from all over this country who turn to him as a pastor of pastors. That alone itself uh, is an energy taking enterprise. He's a civic leader in the nation's third largest city, Houston. Its mayor now is a faithful member of his church Sylvester Turner, the other night, he was interviewed on NBC at length by Lester Holt. Ralph is engaged in that city in more ways than I could tell. Um, one of my great favorite anecdotes about Dr. West uh, was early in the presidency of Barack Obama. He was invited to the prayer breakfast in Washington along with hundreds of others. One of the other distinguished guests was Magic Johnson, the storied NBA player. And at the end of that day, Magic looked Dr. West up to get his picture with him. 
I think that's special. <laughs> he wanted his picture with Dr. West. Dr. West, Ralph, is a dear friend of me for many years, an affiliate faculty here. Uh, and a person, if I could just say this, who is witness to the fact that careful, authentic, studied biblical preaching can draw an enormous congregation without prosperity gospel, <laughs> without gimmicks or tricks, just the exposition of the Word of God by someone who loves the people of God. And I'd like to note that too. One time Dr. Gardner C. Taylor was interviewed here and we asked him, what makes for a good preacher? And he said, love of God and love of people. And Dr. West loves the Lord and he also loves people and that comes across to thousands of people. So Ralph, you're at home here. This isn't the first time at all that you've been here and will certainly not be the last. So we welcome you today uh, to this pulpit as we join together in worship. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne of grace to say thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for all the beautiful people that are standing in this room, Lord God, to hear your word through Dr. Ralph West, Father God. And I just pray that you may speak through him, Lord God, that it may be your words that comes through his mouth, Father God, and that we may have a blessed ceremony today, Father God, and that everything will be about you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Good morning, Truett Seminary. My name is Troy Dix, uh, and there's is Eric Amus, and he is a PhD from the music department. Thank you for playing with us. Um, this is a meditation from Thomas Dorsey, uh, who was sung by the famous Mahalia Jackson. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am lonely. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on. Oh, 
This morning's scripture will come from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. Hear these words. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Well, saints, you can stomp your feet. You can clap your hands. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? If it had. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Where would I be if it had? He let the sun shine through a cloudy day. Oh, he wrapped me. He wrapped me in the cradle of his arms. When he knew I'd been battered and torn, so it, it had not. Sing true if it had not been for the Lord on my side.
Good morning. Thank you so much, Eric and Troy, for blessing us with words from Dorsey and Margaret Duro on the day. It's good to be here to Dean Steele. Thank you, Dr. Gregory, and to see Dr. Garland and Matt Snowden. And I'm calling a lot of names, so if I need help through the sermon, they can come to the rescue. It's good to be here on this Lord's Day and to be in celebration as we celebrate with the black seminarians here at Truett Seminary. Luke 4 has been read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed be free, the Lord of liberty. James Weldon Johnson received an invitation from his high school in Jacksonville, Florida to be the speaker to the senior class in preparation to celebrate Abraham Lincoln's birthday. He took his pen and began to work through some notes to write a speech to the high school. He quickly changed directions and his speech turned into a piece of poetry. And then he thought he would do something with that poetry. He handed it to his brother and his brother assigned music to it. And to his delight, when he went home, 500 young people raised their voices and sang, lift every voice and sing. The earth and heaven rings, rings with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicings rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound as loud as the rolling seas. It's an anthem that begins in praise. James Abington teaches at Emory University at Candler School of Theology. He's been a guest on our campus on a couple of times during our Alleluia Chorus. He was being interviewed about this hymn on an occasion when he taught it to 1,000 voices a rainbow coalition of people, Anglo-Americans, African-Americans, Koreans, Jews, Arabs, and it was being taught during the time of the Gulf War, according to his interview. He said when he taught the song, it was not met with resistance, but initially people didn't see the sense of them having to sing this piece of literature. At the end, he was approached by a group that said to him, this hymn belongs not just to African Americans, does it? Almost startling, they said, but anyone who is true to their God and true to their native land. I wish more people would sing it on more occasions than just February. It's a wonderful piece of music to sing, a great, peace for the church to join in. In January of last year, an all-male white choir sang this at the inauguration for the second term of the mayor at the city of Houston. Probably the most arresting singing was at a group of Baptist women. I must admit that when I walked into that room, my heart sank. It seemed like such a sad service initially. And one of the ladies stood and they began to sing, lift every voice and sing to earth and heaven rings. And that was a kind of light of hope that broke through that worship service. Jesus hadn't read Johnson's words but he seems to embody them when he is about to return home to preach his initial sermon in his home church. There's a kind of uniting of heaven and earth, like this anthem that does not begin in a dark despair, but 
in bright hope, not in bitterness, but in sweetness, not in despair, but in hope, not in a minor key, but a major key. And Jesus seemed to have done that in an embodied way in which he brought heaven and earth together. And he's going home to do work at the home church. It happens after he had had a rendezvous with evil in the wilderness. He had registered himself in prayer to God and now he's been tempted and he comes out of this wilderness and he's being led home. And when he gets home, as the custom would be, there was nobody who had liturgically selected what would be read that day or who would stand up and proclaim the message for that morning. It was open to whoever had, uh, I guess, the opportunity to do it. And maybe this was his moment he felt like Jesus did. And something happens at that very moment. He takes the scroll and he reads from Isaiah. And at that very moment, you pick up when you read this. Casual readers, pick it up, whether they phrase it this way or not, that liberty begins in the house of God. That there's something free that takes place when people get to God's house. This is the Father's house, and he is at home with God the Father, and now he is at worship, and there's liberty that takes place in this house. I'm a pastor, that's where I do my work. And every week and month and year, the battle intensifies over somebody questioning whether you need to, in quotes, go to church. My mind immediately went back to 1977 in Carpet College Chapel on the campus of Bishop College. The dean of the chapel is a wonderful man who lives now as an octogenarian in South Carolina. His name is Harry S. Wright. And Dean Wright stood up one Friday in convocation and said that he was approached by a lovely young lady, a student of our college, and asked him, Dean, do I have to go to church? And that morning, he took that question and assigned it to one of the Sabbath passages in the Old Testament and called it a day for us. And he said, she asked me, do I have to go to church? And he said, I told her, no, you don't have to go. You don't no, need to go, no. Ought go, no. But you ought to want to go. When you think of the God of creation and God's coming to us and breaking in history through Jesus Christ and giving his life on the cross and resurrecting for your salvation and your reconciliation to him, that ought to be enough for you to say, I don't have to go to church, no. Need to go, ought to go, no. But ought to want to go. And Jesus must have been motivated, I think, by something like that, that it was his custom. He had been brought up that way. And so he goes back to the place where liberty has always begun. It's something liberating about going into God's house. I was listening, and I didn't want to get too distracted listening to precious Lord take my hand. And I thought about the verse, at the river, Lord, I stand. Guide my feet, hold my hand. And I thought of those words in light of the pandemic that we're in and how many people have lost loved ones to death. They have succumbed to death. And to be reminded today in chapel, in church, that God can meet us at the river and cross us over. That's liberation that takes place in God's house. But that's not all you find there. There's liberation that sounds from God's book. 
Jesus didn't stand up and just start reciting something that came off the top of his head. The living word began to read the written word. And he reaches back not to and to deal with the liberality of the scribes or the high rationality of the Sadducees or the fundamentalism of the Pharisees, but he picks up the scriptures because in it liberation comes from God's book. And he reads from that book to the people that are there in that church service on that day. And they are hearing the prophet speak and he's reminding them that from this book that the scripture will be fulfilled. In fact, when he declares that it is fulfilled in your hearing, those words uh, at a distance doesn't mean very much to many people. But can you imagine that day Jesus standing up, taking an 800-year-old document, reading it to the people, and saying to them, in essence, and I am the fulfillment of what I'm reading about. Now, if I tried that, especially in this space, some of you would say, uh, we need to get Wes, he's bumped his head. <laughs> there wasn't much difference that day when Jesus stood up and read that and said, in me now the scripture is fulfilled. All the institutions and their shadows, they were pointing to me. The prophetic predictions were pointing toward me. Ceremonial unfoldings were looking at me. I am that now. And you don't have to look for it any further. And that's why I hold to this book. Oh, I, I know at times that when I preach from this book, there are people that will under their breath say, old time preaching. I don't know any other way of doing it, but I can tell you this much about this book. It's not just words on page, it's living word, it's breathing word, it's viable words. And those that engage it, they encounter living word. There's power in that word. In the African-American church experience, that's almost a cue for people to yell, amen. It is. Power in that word. You, you hear it because this book is not just words on page. There's a documentary that was released that Henry Louis Gates did on the black church and It was in segments, the second segment, in my estimation, this is Ralph West speaking, failed to fulfill the beautiful and rich intent of the African-American church experience. It turned the black church into being misogynistic and hate-mongering and dismissive of people. And I said to my congregation, I don't know that church. The church that I know of is a church that is filled with liberation and preaches from a book of liberation. It's something that is alive and welcoming when you read this book. And it's living and things happen when people engaged it. That's what happened, unfortunately. After 17 years of grueling missionary work in the Democratic Congo, Dr. William Leslie, a pharmacist and a medical missionary, had worked tirelessly, tirelessly. And after coming to some sharp tension with one of the leaders in the Congo, he went back to America depleted and despondent, vocationally discouraged, ministerially doubtful about everything that he had done. And nine years after return, he died. 84 years later, Eric Ramsey, along with World Ministries, would fly over to the same spot, and they were looking for nothing. And after retracing Leslie's steps through the jungles and across the rivers and up the mountains, in his words, like glistening diamonds 
in a dense forest, we found churches, not just churches, hundreds of churches. And one church that we found sat 1,000 people in the 1980s, and then that church began to plant churches. No one had been to seminary, divinity school, Bible college. All that had been left was a Bible, not even in that language, but in France. And this Leslie, Dr. Leslie, taught the children how to read the Bible, the French Bible. And somebody, I don't know who, where, they took that Bible and began to read the Bible stories. And as a result, God began converting, birthing churches and meeting needs of people. There's liberty in God's house. There's liberty in God's book. But there's liberty that is actually from the heart of God. Jesus now is going to, on that day, speak of his person and his ministry. The spirit of the Lord has come upon him, and these are not new words to him. You follow his ministry, and you see how this has gone to work. In Mark, the heavens split open, and Luke, there's this bodily form of the Holy Spirit and a dove, and then there's this voice that speaks, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Holy Spirit at baptism, Holy Spirit at his birth, Holy Spirit now at the proclamation on his first day of preaching. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me speaking of he has been empowered by God to be a herald of the good news that only God can give to people who are broken and marginalized and those who have been fragmented by life. Now he stands up and reads this beautiful text in the hearing of the people. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he gives some insight into the preferential interests of God. That God is interested in the poor. Not just the spiritually poor, but even the economically poor. In the Old Testament, this would be more religious than economical. And now Jesus fulfills it and said, God is interested in the poor, the broken, the marginalized, the have-nots. And look where he does his work. Not to the haves, but to the have-nots. To the poor. Howard Thurman writes a little book and he calls it Jesus and the Disinherited. And he says one reason that Jesus was able to identify with these different types of people is because he himself came from the ghettos. And so he was able to recognize the hurt in human beings. He would even sound this in his great sermon, on the mount, and then later in this writing, the Sermon on the Plain, he would remind them, blessed are the poor. The spiritually poor, the morally bankrupt, and those that have been abused by life, blessed are they. Hmm. What a word for us to remember that we could take that same gospel to people who are in the margins and say that God has now called us to proclaim good news to those people who are poor. That's one way that we could apply this, is to say, where can we go to take this message to people who are broken and who need to be mended? But his interest is not just in the poor, it's also in the captives. Now, the people who heard this, they had some Old Testament insight of how this champion, the Lord champion, would come in and would vindicate and rescue those who were captive. And now Jesus comes on and again expands upon it and says, but I will set free anyone who is held captive, not just the physical captive, but those who are psychologically, emotionally, those that are abused. Set the captives free, and he's able to do it. That's why I go to church, because every week I need to be set free. And when I hear from God's book, from God's message, 
I know something about being set, set free. He sets the captives free. I, I need to sit down now. Is that about that time? Sit down. I'm looking at this clock here. <laughs> yeah. But to set the captives free. I know why the caged bird sings. Ah, oh, me. When his wing is bruised and bosom sore, when he beats his bars and would be free, it's not a carol of joy or glee, but it's a prey sends upward from his heart's deep core, a plea that he flings to heaven. I know why the caged bird sings. The captives to be set free. And that is a message I believe that people need to hear on Sunday morning. It is a message that when people come to this chapel, they need to hear of people who need to be set free. There are some people who need to be set free just from some of the just life's restraints that's on them. Some people need to remind it that they can be who God is calling them to be in him. Not everybody comes from a background where folk says, you can be somebody. In my tradition, James Brown's say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, was just as much gospel as amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Because every now and then we had to be reminded of that riff, I am somebody. Black and poor, but I am somebody. Freedom, people. That's what church is. People come now to get free. But there's one last thing, and that is this treatment that God has, not just for the poor and the captive. He talks about even the blind. That is, those that need to see, not just need to see physically, but those that need insight for life. Gardner Calvin Taylor preached a sermon on the life of Bartimaeus from Mark chapter 10. And in it, he said, Bartimaeus cried out, Lord, that I might see. And Dr. Taylor said, what did he need to see? He said he needed to see himself. And he needed to see his sin. But most of all, he needed to see a savior. And that's what you find when you come and hear God's word at God's house. Of God can set his people free. I'm done now. But it's liberty. In God's house, God's book from the heart of God, in the summation of his ministry in those particulars, he began to say to us, and I am interested in the poor and the captive, the blind, and I sit down, and the oppressed. And the oppressed. I started my religious studies in 1977, and at that time, about eight years in, or uh, eight years later, uh, from the writing of Cone's Black Theology, Black Power. I remember we had the little red book they gave to us, and we read that in school. And then in Dean Wright, the same one that talked about you don't have to, you ought to want to go to church. He had the little blue and black book. That's how they described Cone's books, the spiritual and the blues. And even then, Cone was hinting to his, his book, what he describes as his knockout punch book. He says he was getting ready to start talking about the God of the oppressed. I like that. Because God of the oppressed is not just God for any one particular people, but for anybody that's oppressed. That God in Jesus Christ breaks into human history and comes to us where we are and lifts us to where we ought to be. I like that. No wonder Jesus in that sermon said, and that's my sermon, and I'm proclaiming the favor of the Lord today. 
Again, we need help when we read this, but those people say, did he just make a reference to Leviticus and the Jubilee? Or was he talking about Isaiah and setting the captives free? That, that was a time after a person had been enslaved and worked that after so many years they would be set free. Goods would be returned to them. A kind of spiritual reparation, you say. And for them, it was a physical reparation. Things would be given back to them. They had worked, and now they would be repaid. And on this particular day, Jesus says, I'm coming to give you something that's been taken away from you. I'm going to give life to you. Real life. And that's why I have come. The writer of Luke would go on to say about this. To seek and to save that which was lost. That's why I've come. To give you life. And to give you life as the other evangelists would say. To give it to you abundantly. No wonder Johnson began that anthem by reminding us. Lift every voice and sing. Tear earth and heaven rings, rings with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Thank you, Dr. West, for those words of encouragement and life to us. It has been uh, one whirlwind of a season. Uh, but if you will uh, open up your hymnals to 573 and stand with me, we will lift every voice and sing that it is well with our souls together because we are united in Christ.
Uh, we've been taught from the scriptures even when we didn't know they were scripture. So let me pray this benediction over you from Numbers 6, 24 through 27. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go into the world. Amen.